This week on Inside the Headset, we are featuring the University of Montana's head coach, Bobby Hawk. Coach Hawk discusses his deep history with the university, explains Montana's unique football culture, and shares why he decided to serve on the AFCA Board of Directors. Now, let's get Inside the Headset with Coach Hawk. Coach Hawk, thanks so much for joining us. How are you? Oh, it's great. I appreciate you having me on this morning, man. This is a, a real privilege. Well, uh, hopefully you're getting a little peace and quiet. I know spring ball is kind of coming to an end. I know uh, finals for your student athletes probably going on here over the next couple of weeks and all your coaches are out on the road recruiting. So uh, hopefully everything's pretty smooth for you. It's smooth. You know, our, our fundraising guys know in my downtime when the players are gone after finals and the, the assistant coaches are out recruiting, now they commandeer me and they – They've got me touring around the state here, which is which is a great time. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you are no stranger to the to the great state of Montana. Um, I've been super intrigued with kind of your background. Super unique in terms of uh, number one, this has been your third stint at, at Montana. Actually, I, I guess technically your fourth stint, student athlete. Fourth, yeah, yeah. student, yeah, <laughs> yeah, student athlete, and then uh, you, you, you kind of cut your teeth as a GA, uh, you know, young coach, and then you you head this your second stint as a head coach. I just kind of want to rewind back to that. Uh, uh, um, plan days transitioning into college. Uh, you actually ran track, uh, but but end up as a college coach. Just talk to us a little bit about that 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 backstory because there's got to be something there that's interesting. I know. Yeah, kind of kind of an unorthodox path, you know. Right. Uh, so I, I was always a football guy. My dad was a high school football coach in this state, uh, a great one, by the way. And so when I I couldn't play football anymore, so then I was kind of I was a student at Montana. I couldn't play anymore. I was trying to figure out what direction. I actually worked for Mike Montgomery, helping out with the basketball team. I kind of thought I wanted to coach, but then I needed to compete. So I ended up doing the pole vault and throwing the javelin and doing some things in track and field and really enjoyed that. And as I was graduating, I was contemplating going into the Marine Corps, actually. And uh, I got an opportunity to coach. Uh, Don Reed was the head coach here, who head coach at Oregon and um, a small college in Oregon. And then he was the head coach here. And my brother was on the team and all American for them. And he, he said, uh, you ever think about coaching football? And I said, yeah, I didn't know this would be an opportunity. And he said, well, welcome aboard. And i uh, been working at it ever since. So I'm very grateful to, you know, Don Reed, Terry Donahue, who are, who are, you know, great legendary coaches in the different parts of the country. And then Rick Neuheisel, uh, Steve Axman, guys that gave me jobs. I'm just very grateful to those guys for giving me jobs and letting me do what I love. That that That's awesome. And I love that you slipped a part in there. Your, your brother was All-American in Montana and then had a, I want to say, a pretty lengthy NFL career. Yeah, I think, I think the number's 14 years in the NFL. Right, right. And so – I, I, I want to kind of tie this into Montana, to the state of Montana. So, I, although you know you got one that you can point directly to in terms of you know a, a Montana high school football player that had a tre- tremendous uh, collegiate career and obviously had a long NFL career, there's not a ton of those kind of guys that, that come out the state of Montana. But somehow Montana, uh, you know, the football program, actually both of them, uh, you know, both the FCS programs do a tremendous job. Where, you know, what's the recruiting philosophy? Hey, don't be giving those other guys too much credit. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I know I, that's probably <laughs> the wrong place for that. But, uh, no, but, they're doing a good job. I have to admit it. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. You guys are, are, are doing fantastic. So, you know, what, what's been your recruiting philosophy in, in these stops in Montana? Because I know you can't fill out a, a, a full roster of Montana kids. Well, it's, it's an interesting uh, thing here. Um, and we, we really base our recruiting in Montana. And, you know, the Montana kids grow up. It's, it's different than a lot of FCS schools. Montana kids grow up wanting to play here at the University of Montana. And so we get to mine that as best we can. I mean, they, they play six and eight and 11 man, man football in, in the state. And we've had kids from all those kinds of programs. We have them currently on our team. We've had eight-man football players go play in the NFL. Oh, wow. Uh, so, it, yeah, it's it's really uh, um, an interesting thing. You know, I've, I've got a long family history here. I'm a, I'm a third-generation alum of this university. My kids are fourth-generation alums. My daughters went to grad school here. 
My son's actually an All-American player on our team currently. So uh, we got a lot of history. It's been a real privilege to be a part of it and, and maybe have an impact on the place. But I think that permeates through our state and about half our kids come from Montana, including some small towns. Well, that, that's, that's interesting you said that. I, I kind of was under the impression that you probably played a lot of six-man, eight-man football in the state, just some 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 of the smaller towns not having a population of full 11-man uh, roster. Um, but yeah, what, what is the – when you get those kids, have you noticed anything, uh, you know, they, they, they tend to lack a little bit in this area or they tend to be a little bit better in this area? Is there, is there anything unique that you found in recruiting some of those six- and eight-man programs? Yeah, I think you have to project a lot in recruiting. You know, at a lot of places, in some places I've worked – I mean, they pop off the film and, and you say, all right, let's go get that guy and, and win that recruiting battle. Uh, here you have to project where they're going. And I think there's a real art to that. Yeah. Uh, I think our staff over the years, it, it, a couple of different times, has done a nice job of that because a lot yeah. of these kids, I mean, there they're, they're, they're are schools that get together that are near, nearby towns so they can form a team. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're a collective of schools. And, you know, a lot of these kids are playing three and four sports, uh, working on the farm or ranch in the summer. So you have to figure out where they're going and not where they are. Yeah. Uh, so you recruit frames, athletes. We've recruited more kids off the basketball floor here than you can uh, shake a stick at. Oh, that's interesting. Well, that's uh, clearly you guys have done a fantastic job with that. And that's, that's uh, extremely interesting. Probably, probably some great insight for, for guys out there. Now, uh, You've, you've had the opportunity to fill out two staffs there in Montana, you know, both, both in your first stint and your second stint. Um, you know, what are a few characteristics that you're looking for in staff members that, that kind of can come in and, uh, you know, fit that Montana culture that you're looking for? Well, it's a, a unique deal, and I, I think you probably got a chance to look at our staff. We have a group of guys that have coached a lot of places and, you know, coordinated at places like Florida and Notre Dame on our coaching staff. Um, Washington State. And so um, I tend to hire guys that I know. That's not certainly exclusive, but I, I want to I wanna bring together a group of guys that I know is going to function well together. And, you know, the salary scale here is not like it is some places. A lot of these guys have great experience and, you know, they get job offers and they have to make those decisions on quality of life work environment and all that. So we try to hire guys we know for the most part, try to provide a great work environment where everybody's uh, enjoying. Um, we've got a generally have a, a mix of younger and older guys in our staff because when people are in the middle ground in their coaching careers, we can't afford them for the most part a lot of times. And, uh, but, you know, I, I look for uh, three characteristics. I, I think there's a lot of people that know the X's and O's of football out there. I think a lot of people spend time learning it, and they can they can uh, talk it through, draw it up on the board. But I, I look for good people that are hardworking and love the game. Um, and on top of that, and hand in hand with loving the game, they've got to love the players and and want to work hard for the players. And when you have that going, yet that's staff chemistry. Absolutely. Well, uh, I, I did, this is a great place for me to plug uh, Coach Pease. I, I actually played for him at Baylor. He was our offensive coordinator. And uh, as he's I, mellowed a little bit now. Huh? What you say now? He's mellowed just a little bit. <laughs> yes, right. Well, yeah, I, I you know, definitely uh, have enjoyed our relationship, especially as I got into coaching and then transition here to the AFCA. So I know you got a fantastic yeah. staff there. Now, as, as far he's, as uh, Brent, Brent, Brent's a great coach, great mind. You know, we. We go so far back, long before he coached you at Baylor. Um, he and I were roommates for a year here in college. Oh wow! So we we go way back. <laughs> I mean, even when he was coaching you at Baylor, he came and we played a September game on a Friday night at uh, Sam Houston. He came down and with his son was on our sideline for that game. Well, how about two thousand four? That is unbelievable. Well, it's a, a small world. I mean, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I've been extremely happy for him. I actually just talked to his wife, Paula, the other day. And so uh, I know you got a uh, fantastic staff there. Now, as far as retention, uh, you know. And, 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 you know, and that's how this goes, right? It's a network, and we all know each other. And um, I think that's one of the things that's special about coaching in general. Um, and Coach Pease's wife, Paula, I knew her in high school. I knew her before he did. <laughs> 
small. I mean, the world gets smaller and smaller. So I'm assuming she's a right. Mont- Montana high school <laughs> as well, huh? She is. She was, and she was the superstar in the house, not Brent, no matter what he tells. <laughs> That's right. Well, yeah, he'll definitely tell me he is. Um, now, as far as uh, re- retention, you kind of hit on that a little bit. Uh, you know, you, you, Brent P is the perfect example. He's, he's obviously had a, a fantastic career, he's coordinated Boise State, Baylor, Florida, uh, you know, as, as, as you kind of mentioned. You know, the, that, that retention, knowing that probably in this era, you're seeing coaches take new jobs probably more than any time. You know, there's so much transition going on. Um, you know, how do you try to implement a culture that, you know, makes coaches want to stay, makes coaches want to want want to to be around there? Well, I think it starts with how you run the team, too. And in this era of NIL and open transfer and all that, it, it, it applies to everybody that's in the – Right. operation, you know, and it's the same. It, so it's the same thing in, in terms of retaining your players. I think you try to provide a, an atmosphere where it's competitive. Uh, it's done the way it's supposed to be done. Everybody feels valued. Uh, it's on the staff, no matter if they're the coordinator or the, the GA or whoever, the same thing with the, with the team. If they're the all American player or the, the, the walk on kid that's running the scout team, they, you have to, make sure they all feel valued in the program. And if they do that, then everybody's pulling the same direction for the most part. Um, they enjoy their time and leaving is hard because they like the situation they're in. So to me, that's what retention's about is people not wanting to leave rather than uh, right. uh, finding reasons to go. Absolutely. And, and when you have a ton of success like you guys have had, I know that's, you know, the calls happen. I mean, that's just a part of it, but that's great when you're able to create an environment that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, so, sometimes you're, you're uh, four times in your salary and your wife's going, we're going. I don't care how much fun you're having. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's true enough. Huh. Now, uh, Coach, you, you've had the opportunity to coach both at the FBS and FCS level, and uh, I, I found it really interesting here. I spent a lot of time in the Sun Belt, and Sun Belt is, uh, over the last decade has taken in about six – uh, FCS programs that come in and actually are really competitive very fast. Um, what 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 have you seen be the what have you seen be the biggest difference between the two levels in terms of talent operation just whatever you know what what's in your opinion what's the big difference between FCS and FBS football? Yeah, aside from the sixty three full versus eighty five full scholarships, so a little deeper, and I, I'm I'm basically going to piggyback on what you just said. Um, you know, within those two subdivisions, you know, there's the the upper level, the SCS. I mean, obviously, Alabama is the standard bearer right now around the country. And, and there's probably 25 schools to 30 schools that are that are kind of there, you know, uh, that are above everybody else. And it's the same thing in, um, excuse me, FBS I was talking about. Yeah. It's the same thing in, in FCS. There are certain leagues like our league or the Missouri Valley, um, uh, CAA, some of them. Um, a lot of those teams in those leagues, for instance, are closer to, say, the Mountain West, the Sun Belt, than those teams are to Alabama. And it's, and it's the same thing within our level. There's some, some leagues at our level that are probably closer to some of the good Division II leagues. So. Um, a lot of good football players, a lot of good coaching going on. Uh, the X's and O's are tremendous, right. I think. Uh, and so, you know, it's just a matter of, of numbers and, and developing. You know, we went and had the uh, good fortune coming out on top at Washington last year. Uh, there are a lot of teams in, in our uh, level at the upper end of it that can play with a lot of teams in FBS football. No question. I, I- I remember being that lower tier FBS uh, in that kind of program. And there were so many teams that you circled and said, man, I don't want to see Montana, North Dakota state. You know, you just, you didn't want to put yourself at, uh, as a division one university out there like that, especially in a money game where you're paying those guys to come down and beat you. Uh, it, and, and so. Uh, yeah. And I've been, I've been on the other end of the, I've been on the receiving end of that as well. So sure. yeah. Uh, it's uh, it, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting uh, dynamic certainly, but, uh, a lot of good football, you know, like you mentioned, North Dakota State, they're kind of the standard bearer at this point in FCS football. Nobody wants to play them. Right. Well, Coach, uh, before I let you go here, you know, I, I definitely did want to tap in on on this part of it. You know, you recently decided to join the, join to serve on the AFCA Board of Directors, and obviously there's a 
there's a ton on the docket right now with uh, NIL, one-time transfers, you know, all you know, just all the stuff that's going on in college football. Mm-hmm. What 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 motivated you to get involved on the board, and and what has that experience like been uh, been like thus far? Well, first of all, as you mentioned, it's a crazy time, uh, almost historically crazy right. in college football right now. We're navigating a lot of things, um, but a, a couple of things. One. You know, the fact that uh, Coach Barry has done such a, in my opinion, a magnificent job uh, with the AFCA and helping us to have a voice and um, making it so we're working with all the different groups around the country uh, from the NCAA on to the different levels of football, all of it. I just think that uh, that Todd's done a, a job, uh, just an outstanding job there. Uh, he's worked really hard at it. And then... You know, when I was a young coach, uh, I looked at the AFCA Board of Trustees, and that was kind of the who's who in college coaching. And so for me to get asked to serve on the board was such a, an honor uh, to be a part of that. Um, you have a chance to give back to the game, specifically college football, and and then maybe make and have a chance to make even more impact on young coaches. So impact the game, impact young coaches, um, and really not to be self-serving, but it's, it's a real personal honor to be there. Well, we're, we're definitely honored to have you, Coach. Uh, you know, obviously been able to represent all the different voices in, in, in college football and, and making sure our voice is unified as we continue to try to make the game better is, is extremely important. So thanks for your role in that. And uh, once again, thanks for sitting down and talking, talking a little uh, career and ball with me. It's, it's been my honor. And if you ever need anything from our, us, just give us a shout, Coach. Thank you so much. All right. I'll see you soon. Go Grizz. All right. Thanks, Coach. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Inside the Headset. If you heard anything on this episode that you would like to learn more information about, head over to AFCAPodcast.com where you can find every episode and all of the corresponding show notes. While you're there, take a second to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for the show, please let us know by sending an email to podcast at AFCA.com. Make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at Inside the Headset and tag it when you share each episode. You can stay up to date with all things AFCA by following the at we are AFCA Twitter account. Every episode of Inside the Headset can also be found on your favorite audio streaming platforms such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. If you are not currently a member of the AFCA, be sure to find us online at AFCA.com and apply to join over 10,000 NFL, college, and high school coaches from around the country who are striving to be the best they can be. With an AFCA membership, you gain invaluable access to the annual AFCA convention, the bi-monthly magazine, and the new and improved digital library, which contains thousands of videos and articles contributed by hundreds of current and former football coaches. You can also visit AFCAinsider.com to sign up for our free weekly email newsletter on the right-hand side of the screen. It comes out every Tuesday at lunch and is filled with great articles and stories written by many of the same coaches you hear on the podcast. It's geared to help you become a better coach tomorrow than you are today. Be sure to connect with me on Twitter at Coach Mario Price. And remember, the AFCA is not just an annual convention. It is an association that continually promotes education, guidance, and networking. But it is also so much more than that. The AFCA is about celebrating the past and educating the future. It is about developing great coaches who will produce great teams and even better people. So invest in your skill set and impact today by engaging with the AFCA.